morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to you all and also to those who are joining us via web streaming this morning. So the purpose of this press conference today is to present you with the latest EMCDDA Europol analysis of the EU drug market. This is an analysis that we do every three years. Uh, we started in 2013, and this is the fourth round. Um, unlike in previous years, where the results were presented in a single report, um, we've taken a different approach this time, and we're releasing the findings gradually in a series of online modules. Um, today, we're kicking off with the modules on cocaine and methamphetamine. So these modules are already online. You can already consult them. And in the room, you have the Wi-Fi details um, if you'd like to connect. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce the panel. We're um, delighted to announce the two directors of the agencies. Uh, we have the EMCDDA director, Alexi Guzdale, and the Europol executive director, Catherine de Bol. Uh, so first, I will give the floor to Alexi to begin his presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Bester Catherine, <laughs> welcome back to Brussels. I'm very delighted to present uh, this report together with Catherine de Bol. Uh, that's the fourth edition of the joint uh, drug market report published by EMCDDA and by Europol. It's, uh, it's the result of a very close cooperation between our two agencies. And uh, I had the opportunity last week in my visit to Europol to, uh, to thank Catherine and the colleagues again. Uh, we, we have done a very good job the, the recent years, and we have new projects and new challenges in front of us. And today we are going to share with you the information and the reflections about some of those uh, upcoming challenges. Uh, this, as Cathy says, this, uh, this report is different from the previous one. It, uh, it's becoming modular, more interactive, digital, um, and it's also structured uh, on following the, the structure of the work we do for the threat assessments for our contribution to impact and SOCTA, and it is using multi-data sources of information. Today, we focus on two specific topics that are relating to the European stimulants market, which is cocaine and methamphetamine, and uh, we are going to report uh, different analysis on the other substances later this year. Cocaine has become now a very well-established problem in the European Union. Why, while we can say that methamphetamine is establishing itself in a consistent and dangerous th emerging threat uh, overall in the EU. Of course, the size of the two problems is still different, uh, but uh, we see a common trend in the increase both in drug production, trafficking, and drug use. What is also uh, important to notice is the important and growing role of non-European Union organized criminal groups, uh, Colombian criminal groups in the case of uh, cocaine, and a criminal organized group from Mexico in the case of methamphetamine, but also a growing role for organized criminal groups from other regions of the world, in particular from the Western Balkans. And I think it's of particular interest if we look at the relationship between the EU and some of those different partner countries or groups of countries. And of course, there is a, a growing impact in terms of the production of billions of euros of profit. If we focus a few minutes on cocaine, what we can say is that there is a high and the highest ever availability with high purity low or stable prices, we consider that the affordability of cocaine has reduced by 38%. So the cost uh, to, to get access to, to cocaine is easier, 38% easier over the last years. Um, we have a growing consumer market uh, following the pressure of the offer on the, on the consumer basis. And we have, uh, uh, in, at local level, but a, a growing problem with uh, a small free base market, which is crack cocaine use, uh, also called uh, free base, and that is characterized by a uh, high risk, uh, both for safety, security, and public health. Together, those, uh, those events are shaping a different role for the EU in the international trade of uh, cocaine trafficking. And we also observe a dynamic European ports management with the growing uh, use by organized criminal groups of secondary ports. So 
the picture today is not only about Rotterdam or Antwerp, but uh, with uh, plenty of other ports. And uh, you can even find some, some uh, very good references and uh, analysis in some podcasts or new papers. For instance, recently there was a podcast from Le Monde on the situation in Le Havre port in France. And you have all, all the situation in other ports like Marseille. As you know, uh, there, are, there are a lot of uh, challenges uh, associated to drug trafficking and drug consumption in that city. It's not the only one. We see record seizures. And of course, what is uh, uh, more new in the recent years is the fact that we observe now in Europe the arrival of all forms of cocaine. And the most surprising for me is the fact that we find cocaine paste and cocaine base that are being transformed on the territory of the European Union. And those have not been detected through seizures, but only through the seizures of the laboratories. And I'm sure that uh, Kathleen and the colleagues from Europol will share uh, their analysis on that uh, situation. And as I said, there is a growing impact in terms of risk for security and safety, but also for public health. If we look at methamphetamine, the size of the market is much smaller, but it's fast expanding. And uh, actually, there was an increase in the seizures on the territory of the European Union in the last years by 477%, which is a very, very important increase. We see uh, an increase in the seizures, but also in the production of methamphetamine on the territory of the EU, with signals of increased use, uh, and I would like to flag the fact that uh, until five, seven years ago, the use of methamphetamine essentially under the form of pervitin was localized in Czech Republic, a bit uh, expanding in Slovakia. And a few years ago, for the first time, through the, the wastewater analysis, uh, a laboratory detected some traces of methamphetamine use uh, in Estonia and in Finland. And it was a real surprise for Finland because there was no history whatsoever of methamphetamine use. And following the following research that was done after once, we can see that now there is a, not a big size, but still a growing problem of uh, methamphetamine use also in Northern Europe. Another characteristic is the industrial scale of the production and the capacity with the involvement of uh, cooks, chemists uh, coming from uh, the Mexican cartels, and the, the development of uh, crime as a service, which means that uh, traffickers, producers, and organized crime are providing a broad set of services that actually allow to sell and equip any kind of laboratory for the production of synthetic drugs. That's a very worrying change and that it is very noticeable compared with what was the situation a few years ago. And then finally, uh, I think it's important to mention that as we have highlighted and informed a few years ago, uh, there is a change in, in Afghanistan that started some years ago uh, driving to the production of, uh, of methamphetamine uh, coming uh, more directly from the plant, ephedra, or with ephedrine. And uh, even uh, if uh, it's not yet fully documented, we don't know if there are huge quantities arriving to Europe yet, still, uh, potentially, uh, there is a, a possibility for the methamphetamine produced in Afghanistan to come to Europe. Why? Because it's very cheap to produce it. Uh, and the yield in the production makes it uh, easier to, to sell and to use it directly. So, high, again, a high potential, high risk for safety, security, and for those who have been looking at uh, Breaking Bad or who are following other news, looking at the situation in the US, in Australia, or in Southeast uh, Eastern Asia, I think one of the things we certainly don't know, don't want, is to have a real epidemic of methamphetamine use or crystal meth, as for instance, there, is, there are some pockets of use, for instance, in Athens. So, in a nutshell, the, the, the situation we depict in those two analyses, it contributes to the overall analysis we, we make, which is that drugs are everywhere, Everything can be used as a drug and everyone can be uh, the, the victim or the object of the, the, the actor or know something, uh, someone uh, having a problem of uh, addiction uh, to one or another substance. And in this case, we have a, a, a strong potential 
for uh, those problems to be the perfect storm. We have depicted a situation that is at risk, especially for the vulnerable groups, and the war in Ukraine certainly is not making uh, the situation easier just because of its negative impact on the economy that uh, in turn may have also an impact uh, with the, the groups that are more vulnerable in the society. So what can we do? Uh, the report is presenting a set of recommendations for policy and action, following and in line with the structure, as I said, for SOCTA and IMPACT. Uh, certainly, as more production is taking place in Europe, both for methamphetamine and cocaine, especially from cocaine paste and cocaine base, uh, we have a bigger challenge as far as precursors and the control of chemical precursors are concerned. And I think we need to update our perception and understanding of the problem because more than ever, when we speak about drugs in Europe, it's not only about injecting drug users that for the moment represent still an important part of the problem, but proportionally a smaller one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Alexi, and now over to you, uh, Catherine de Bol. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alexis, uh, for the floor, and, and uh, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the press. It's an opportunity again to be here, and as Alexi said, uh, it's a tradition that uh, Europol and EMCDDA, we work jointly on um, the evaluation of the situation of drugs in the EU, and it's a tradition that we want to keep as long as possible. Um, the two markets uh, that are presented uh, today, um, the cocaine market determines largely the drugs landscape in the EU and methamphetamine, as Alexis said, is an expanding market. For us, law enforcement, it is really an important to understand how these markets are developing, to understand who are the criminal actors behind these markets and what can we do about it? How do we have to tackle this? How, how do we have to deal with this situation? Because as you understood, it's a very difficult situation we are in. We know now that um, almost 40% uh, of the criminal networks operating at the international level reported to Europol are active in drugs trafficking. And we expect that this will increase because uh, drugs remains one of the most lucrative markets uh, that are existing. So for us, for Europol and for the law enforcement community in the European Union, it is a priority to, to, track, to tackle drugs. And um, I would like to start with a positive note. Step by step, we are becoming more successful altogether in tackling the criminal networks uh, behind. Never before there have been as uh, much as seizures as the last uh, four years. Seizures, arrests, and lapses that we detected. The operations uh, you all heard about, EncroChat, Sky, and Trojan Shield, have given us insights into the market that we never had before, and in particular, the financial transactions uh, behind and the modus operandi used by the criminal organizations. These insights, they have also served as input for the reports that we uh, present today. Let me uh, outline some of the concrete insights we can take away from the reports that we pre uh, present to you today. And let's start with the home front and the worrying increase of the methamphetamine market in the EU. The reality we all know is that the EU is not just a destination area in drug trafficking, it's also a significant region of origin and a region of transit. And criminal networks, they produce a very wide range of synthetic drugs in the EU, which are distributed globally, including, for instance, uh, destinations as um, Australia and Japan. We see an increasing number of drug laboratories active in the EU, producing synthetic drugs, and in particular, methamphetamine. The trafficking and the industrial scale production of methamphetamine is growing. It's a growing problem for the EU, as methamphetamine is a generator of many millions of euros of illicit profits uh, for those trading in this substance. The presence, as mentioned also already by Alexi, 
of uh, Central and South American actors in the EU in uh, synthetic drugs is a fact. On several occasions, multi-ton quantities in methamphetamine produced in South America have been seized in the EU. And most of the time it was uh, coming from uh, Mexico. And what is also a very worrying trend we see is that specialized chemists operating from South America are also active in the labs here in the European Union. It highlights the international scale of the issue, uh, of the fact that it is dangerous and that it is highly profitable that we uh, encounter this uh, in the EU uh, today. It's also clear that it is a criminal service industry that is very sophisticated and it has uh, grown and is still growing all the time. Some EU-based criminal networks have specialized in um, and deal exclusively in the logistical supply chain and in the logistical services uh, for criminal organizations for this synthetic drugs production, or they are responsible for the transport, or they are responsible for the recruitment of the people who need to work in the labs. The industrialized methamphetamine market is an increasing threat uh, to our society, indeed not only from the viewpoint uh, of the criminal actors, but also the health impact cannot be underestimated. On the cocaine market, the seizures of cocaine were never so high in the past four years. This shows that law enforcement activities are becoming more and more successful, but drugs trafficking and the fight against drugs trafficking is an uphill battle. What do we see? Not only the corruption increased, but in particular, the corruption is more worrying because of the intimidation of port workers in our EU harbors. More and more port workers are threatened by criminals in and around the ports, or they are offered large, large amounts of uh, money to support uh, the trafficking of drugs. Another worrying problem is the use of violence. Violence nowadays is a key feature for criminal organizations to make sure um, that they are the strongest in their um, business area. The violence has also a direct impact on citizens on the streets because we see um, uh, people dying on, on the streets in the European Union. And lastly, clearly visible, is the waterbed effect. When criminal um, organizations see that police interventions are more structured and organized in certain areas, they replace uh, their field of action. They will always stay in the harbors where the volumes are big, but they will also look for alternatives. And that is what we see new. now. We see really a waterbed effect towards, for instance, harbors as Dunkirk or uh, harbors in Spain and Italy, uh, even Germany, uh, due to this effect. What is um, helping uh, drugs criminals is the containerized maritime uh, trafficking. They use the containerized uh, uh, maritime trafficking for the traffic of cocaine through the major harbors uh, like Rotterdam and, and, and Antwerp. And we see, even with all the uh, actions of uh, the law enforcement community, that this uh, continue to grow and uh, also increasing numbers in the smaller um, ports. How do we approach this? Um, for us, it's very important that we have to recognize that um, drugs, uh, cocaine, uh, methamphetamine that we systematically need to prioritize our investigations against high value targets, which pose the, hard, the most important risk uh, to our societies. And we need to do this in the framework of international operational task forces. So we need to work together and we need to put the people, the investigators together to develop actions uh, that are intelligence led to tackle the criminal groups uh, behind. 
In the drug economy, we also need to go against the chief executive officers, those who are holding the key positions in uh, the criminal organization, and we have to work on their money flows. We have to trace the assets and we have to go uh, through confiscation. Uh, at Europol and the law enforcement, uh, with the law enforcement partners, what do we do? We recently re-established uh, the drugs unit. We did not have a drugs unit anymore, and the aim is to pool the resources together uh, and to pool our efforts together so that we really can focus on uh, high-value targets orchestrating the drugs uh, trafficking. And we are also developing a drug intelligence fu fusion platform uh, at Europol. It aims to synchronize all the efforts that we undertake in the European Union and with our international partners related uh, to um, the drugs uh, criminals. International cooperation, of course, is key. We have key partners uh, globally that uh, we can trust. We have our partners in the United States of America. The, the Drug Enforcement Agency is for us a very important, important uh, partner. We have uh, liaison officers uh, from Colombia at Europol, and Colombia just decided to send extra investigators uh, to uh, Europol to support the operational task forces in the headquarters. And soon we will have Brazilian investigators also at the headquarters in The Hague uh, to support also these operational task forces. And the last years we invested heavily in our data analysis capacities. Um, in order to make use of the information that we got out of the big operations like uh, EncroChat, SkyOCC, among uh, other sources. We can say from a law enforcement perspective that a lot have been, has been achieved uh, in the fight against uh, drugs, but as the two reports uh, show, we, uh, we still have to go uh, the way. We are not there yet, and we need to double down on our efforts. It is clear that we need an integrated approach, uh, that we need a lot of information exchange and sharing, not only at European level, but that we trusted partners all over the world. Investment in prevention is of key importance, and harm and supply reductions, uh, reduction is uh, very important. Europol is there to support the member states in the Union and member states with whom we have an operational agreement. Um, for us, it's a key priority. It will remain a key priority. And we are very hap happy with the cooperation with EMCDDA because it gives us good insights in what is going on on the drug market. And also with them, we can uh, work uh, further on this excellent collaboration and develop action plans to, ta to tackle the criminal groups behind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll now open the question and answer session. Um, so the questions um, could be put in English, um, and if we can focus on the content of, of today. Uh, my colleague Sonia here will be going around with the microphone. Um, yeah, so if there are any questions, please, ah, in the, uh, or could you um, state your media organization and to whom you're addressing the question? Thank you. My name is Inder Bugarin. I'm a journalist from Mexico from El Universal newspaper. I would like to know Europol's threat assessment of the Mexican drug cartels, how Europol evaluates this threat. And about fentanyl, what's the situation in Europe and if fentanyl could be the next, next, next stage of Mexican Dutch Belgium collaboration? Okay, thank you. Yes, good, uh, good morning. Thank you for this question. Indeed, we see a clear link, uh, Europe-Mexico. Um, Mexican uh, people, uh, drugs criminals from the cartels are, are active on the European soil. Chemists from Mexico come to the European Union um, because they are specialized in the production and in the use of uh, methamphetamine. So we, use, we see that they are uh, active in the labs. We had uh, incidents uh, with Mexicans, one that two found uh, on the streets uh, in the Netherlands, for instance, coming out of an explosion of a, of a lab. Um, we are worried about uh, fentanyl. We don't, we don't see it yet uh, in, in a huge number on the European soil. 
but we are worried because we know that uh, the Mexican chemists, they are responsible for the production of the, of the fentanyl for Northern America. So it is a worrying trend to us, and we, we have to look at the possibility that also here the production of fentanyl could, uh, could start. Yeah, what, what, I, what I could add regarding fentanyl is that you probably know that the, the situation in the EU is different from the US, for instance, uh, regarding the epidemic of uh, fentanyl. In fact, on the territory of the European Union, fentanyls, we detected fentanyls already years ago for the first time together with Europol through the European Early Warning System on new psychoactive substances. So I would say we have had a, a first wave of uh, NPS uh, belonging to the family of fentanyls. What we see is that, uh, and we will have a more recent analysis to be presented to you in June, the 14th of June, when we present the European Drug Report. Um, and you will see that for the moment, we see that uh, the, the, the evolution of the, the arrival and the consumption of fentanyl is not as important as it was mm -hmm. years ago. Now, uh, Kathleen said very well, Kat, uh, Catherine said very well, we have a, a huge potential for industrial capacity of any kind of synthetic drugs in Europe. So it doesn't mean that if there was an increase in the production of fentanyl, there would be no clients for it. So certainly we need to remain uh, cautious and, and to monitor and to continue the actions mm. uh, from the law and force community. But for, for the moment, what is the drive in the US is an epidemic about the opioids consumption that was partly generated by abusive prescription of painkillers using op uh, containing opioids, which is completely different. Uh, so we, we don't have reasons to be exaggeratedly optimistic. Uh, but certainly, given that the situation and the context are different, uh, for the moment, we, we don't see that as, a, as a, a, a risk or a threat so important as the threat of methamphetamine. Okay. Thank you. Yes, good morning. Uh, Jeff Portmans from Belgian magazine Trends. Um, you've established the role of the EU um, operationally within these two markets. Could you give us an idea of the EU's role uh, financially? Is it um, a financial center within these markets, or what role do, does the EU or do EU member states play uh, in, in, in those terms? Thanks. From a law enforcement perspective, uh, for instance, customs authority, police authorities, they cooperate together to tackle uh, drugs. It's a priority in most of the member states because it's also a priority at European level, and these priorities are determined uh, by the ministers uh, of uh, interior on European level. So we can say that on European level, there is a good uh, cooperation and understanding in between the member states. Um, what we see uh, at Europol, uh, we organize uh, specific organize, uh, um, actions um, uh, related uh, to drugs, uh, to the fight against drugs, and we have grants uh, to support uh, the member states um, in, in this fight against uh, drugs. At EU level, uh, the important development is also um, the port authorities. They cooperate more and more. We have, for instance, the port working group, where you have the port of Amsterdam, uh, of uh, pardon, Rotterdam, uh, Antwerpen, and Hamburg working together to have a good picture of uh, what is coming in. Uh, what are the threats, where are the gaps in our system, and who can we learn from one another. And this is very important. Europol is also part of this. And what we try to do is to have a good intelligence picture. Because before we start with operations, we have to see what is going on. And we can say that the last years, uh, our intelligence picture is much better than it was before. That's why we have also these high numbers of seizures, because we can uh, work more led by the intelligence uh, we gather. Um, as uh, Alexis spoke about uh, the Western Balkan, also with these countries, we have more and more exchange related to uh, drugs criminals and uh, to import and export of drugs in, uh, in their region. So um, when we have a good intelligence picture, then we start with operational task forces. It's always member state driven. Europol supports with uh, uh, data analysis. 
um, and then uh, we decide uh, together um, how uh, we will tackle the different uh, criminal groups uh, behind. If, if I can add, they did a fantastic job at Europol and with the other police forces with EncroChat and uh, SkyCC. And basically what it shows, it's what together with Europol we say for years, uh, that we need to update the perception of what is the drug situation we face. Catherine said in her presentation, I, I did not mention to avoid to repeat, but there is a growing problem of corruption in the EU. And that problem of corruption, among other things, has been, is reflected by the partial analysis of the huge amount of data they managed to collect through EncroChat and, and SkyCC. The problem today is uh, to make sure that the member states uh, will allocate the means to fight even better together against money laundering and also against corruption. What, what I think is extremely useful is to see if you look at the situation in the member states, all the investigations that took place thanks to EncroChat and SkyCC, you have plenty places in all EU member states where nobody would have ever believed that there were drugs or, or storage of drugs or production or trafficking. And, uh, and it reflects that it is everywhere. So as it is permeating the society, also because there is a variety of substance use, much more different and disseminated than before, this leads to a, a false perception that, uh, ah, Injecting drug use, uh, heroin use is not so important, so drugs, it's, it belongs to the past. Uh, in fact, the old drug use belongs probably partly to the past, but we talk about the drug and substance use of today and of tomorrow, and I, I think this is why the, those terabytes of information that were collected uh, through those, those operations and the intelligent, I would say the intelligence it may generate when they will manage to digest those mountains of information, uh, will need then to be used by the member states to strengthen their efforts and coordinate them even better. But the collective tools exist and we have the EU strategy and the action plan that are supporting that. What we, what we also see is the real infiltration um, of the drugs money in the, in the legal economy. And that is really a problem because it undermines the trust in your societies, it undermines the rule of law. And, um, but it's, it's clear that this is happening at the moment. That is why we also um, give a lot of attention to uh, financial investigations because uh, we need to link the two of them and we need to go after the money flows. Um, because remote coordination from drug uh, keep kingpins at the moment is essential. So you have the organizers in the United Arab Emirates or in Brazil, for instance, but the work uh, is done here. Uh, they stay, of course, there because for money laundering activities, it's better. They have good logistical hubs over there and they are out of prosecution in the, in the countries. So uh, for them, it's an advantage uh, system. And that's also something we discovered, this com communication and this remote coordination through the big uh, um, uh, cases that are, are ongoing. Thank you. Uh, next question. Good morning, Samuel Petrucan for the Associated Press. I think Mr. Gosdell mentioned the, the highest level of purity for cocaine uh, in your preliminary speech. Uh, uh, what are the reasons for that? And uh, does it pose an extra th threat to uh, public health? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, and uh, I invite also my colleagues, if they want to complement my answer, do not hesitate uh, because we have the, the lead uh, project responsible for the cocaine analysis and also the lead uh, responsible for the for the report on methamphetamine. I think uh, one of the fact there are many factors. Uh, the, the first factor I think is that uh, since the, the the opening of the peace negotiations with FARC between FARC and the, and the Colombian government years ago, we have seen a, a dramatic increase in the production of cocaine in Colombia. So that's I would say. Uh, that, that's a, a factor that, uh, that means uh, from the origin of the uh, places uh, of production, there was a huge increase. 
what uh, what uh, I, I know has also changed is that uh, there have been improvement in the chemical processing and the yield of the culture and the production of cocaine. So it's not only that they produced more, but the yield in the cultivation and the chemical processes uh, have made that uh, uh, cocaine, there was more cocaine produced and, and of high quality. Uh, and, 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 and then this means that uh, uh, as there, re there is a huge quantity uh, and there is no problem of, unfortunately, despite the huge amount of seizures, and since 2017 they have only increased year on year, uh, what we see is that the, the purity is not changing, which means that uh, for the moment we, we don't know, ex the, you know, the standard question, we will we, we'll never find the final answer, what is the real size of the problem, the real dimension, uh, but certainly the fact that despite all the seizures, cocaine is still remain very pure, means that probably there, is no, there are no consequences yet of the efforts of law enforcement that would mean that uh, for the people who are using drugs, uh, uh, they would notice that the purity has changed. So that's one factor. And another factor which I mentioned, and, and I expressed my surprise if I see, if I look at the evolution in the recent years, is the fact that now, um, when laboratories have been seized, not uh, through standard or normal seizures, uh, we have detected on the territory of the EU laboratories that were transforming cocaine paste and cocaine base. Um, and, and there, uh, the, the, the two risks that I see is first, uh, it, it's, it seems that it, it creates or it closes from some potential producers of chemical precursors. Uh, this means that uh, 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 there is also potentially a risk in, term, in terms of public health because uh, uh, from cocaine paste and cocaine based, it is possible to produce another variety of crack. I, I, I mentioned variety because the crack that is used in Europe is produced from, from, from the, the, the salt, from chlorhydrate, while when it is the one that is used in Latin America is uh, produced from, uh, from uh, cocaine based and cocaine paste, which means potentially more crack available, which is highly addictive and with uh, uh, highly negative consequences for health. So all together, there are certainly other factors. I don't know if Laurent wants to, to add uh, some elements, but those are, uh, as far as I know, the, the main factors. Uh, and, and what is really amazing, and uh, that's what was uh, presented also by Catherine from the, the result from the investigations led uh, or coordinated by Europol, is that uh, this, tend, tend, this trend for the moment is not even stabilizing. So, um, the, which means we, we need to continue to, to be extremely careful. Uh, and, and, uh, and as we say in the analysis, you can find in the report, uh, uh, there is no simple question like why is it in Antwerp or why is it in Rotterdam because the, 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 it's like any commodities market. I think one of the biggest change in the last five to ten years is that uh, now it's circulating all over the globe in containers. Uh, even heroin was seized in the port of Amsterdam two years ago, one ton in a container. I think it was the first time ever. And before, nobody would have imagined that we would have uh, 200 tons or 300 tons almost seized in one year uh, because potentially that's such an amount of money. And luckily for the moment, there are not yet enough consumers to consume it. So as Catherine said, we need to invest not only on safety and security, but also in public health, in prevention. And that's one of the topics that uh, was discussed by the member states at the Council of the EU uh, meeting of the Horizontal Working Party on Drugs two, year, two days ago. There was a specific uh, thematic debate on that. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any more questions? Yep. Mathieu de Mester, l'Agence France Presse, to, to, to follow on this particular topic, um, can, can we have a, an idea with maybe figures on uh, how it, it, it evolved, uh, the, the, this precise question of transformation of, of coke uh, in, in the EU? Because we are usually talking about um, synthetic drugs uh, laboratory to, in, in Lambourg, for example, in Belgium or uh, in the Netherlands. But, uh, is there, can we have a, a precise, concrete idea on, on 
the extent that that took in the, maybe in the last uh, three or four years of this um, transformation of coke. Okay. How many laboratories were, were there seizures in, in in which countries of the EU? Okay, first, uh, if Catherine wants to answer, but Laurent then can give you the precise figures uh, regarding the, the, the laboratories and the seizures. I can just say for the seizures, for instance, um, we thought we had a record seizure in um, 2020 because we, the figures we received uh, from the different member states, uh, we seized uh, in the European Union 214.6 tons in 2020. But now, 2022, we see already, until now, the seizures uh, got uh, 240 tons. Mm. So there is an increase in seizures, but we also expect there is an increase in, in the drugs market uh, globally, because it is um, a very lucrative business, and it remains a very lucrative business. But on the seizures, uh, on the specifics uh, related to drugs and the purity... Laurent? Mm -hmm. I am Laurent Laniel. I work as a scientific analyst. I'm the lead author of the cocaine uh, analysis. So on the labs, uh, between 2018 and 2020, 45 labs were detected in mostly the Netherlands, uh, including 11 in Spain and two in Belgium, uh, cocaine labs. What these labs were doing was transforming, extracting cocaine from carrier materials such as plastic or charcoal um, in which it was chemically integrated. Uh, so de-integrate uh, the cocaine from the carrier materials. And when you do that, what you obtain most of the time is cocaine base. And this cocaine base needs to be transformed into cocaine hydrochloride uh, before it can be sold to consumers. Okay? So um, law enforcement in Holland uh, told us that at least 10 of, the, of these 45 labs that were seized in this three-year period had a capacity to produce 100 to 200 kilos of cocaine hydrochloride a day. Okay? Uh, that's, if you transform into weeks, 1.4 tons a week. Um, I'm not very good at math, but it months it's six-something tons a month of cocaine hydrochloride. Okay? So it's a very, very decent amount. Um, the... Other information is also uh, indicating that these labs in Europe are sophisticated in the sense that they use equipment that seems to be of higher grade than the equipment used, for example, in Colombia, because the equipment is made here in Europe, most likely by people who previously uh, manufactured equipment for uh, the production of amphetamine and MDMA, and also meth uh, in Europe, one. Two, the chemicals used in Europe come from, uh, as far as we uh, know, uh, industrial grade uh, uh, producers of chemicals. Again, a difference in Colombia, most of the chemicals that are used are made in illicit uh, uh, laboratories making precursor chemicals. Okay? So, and they do not reach the grade of industrial quality. They are pretty good grade and they, they produce pretty high uh, purity cocaine in Colombia, but in Europe, all these elements, uh, together with the presence of some Colombian chemists in the labs, uh, indicate that probably production of cocaine hydrochloride in, in Europe is results in a high quality product. Um, on the purity question, if I may add just uh, two things. Basically, um, a lot of cocaine is being produced, incredible amounts, probably historically very high amounts, and because of the uh, increase in the efficiency of the process that Alexi mentioned, all of this cocaine is very high, but maybe not all, but a large proportion of this cocaine is very high purity. Um, and this is sold to a number of actors who are competing with each other to sell it on the market. So obviously they have an interest in trying to sell the purest product, the, the higher quality product. So that's one factor explaining why purity doesn't stop increasing in Europe. Another one, uh, which is more um, perhaps anecdotal, but 
um, we have noticed that in the past, the cocaine that was sent from Colombia to Europe or to the US was adulterated with uh, other substances, cutting agents such as levamisole, for example, um, right in the lab in Colombia or in mm. Peru. Nowadays, the cocaine that is seized in direction to Europe or to the United States from Colombia, from South America in general, is much less adulterated. Some of it is extremely high purity, 97%, 98% purity. It's high purity. This means that the Latin Americans have stopped adulterating the cocaine at the source, and the, most of the adulteration takes place here in Europe in facilities um, dedicated to adulterating the cocaine. Um, but again, because they are in competition, they can't afford to cut it too heavily, otherwise, you know, people would turn to another uh, dealer who sells better quality product. Thank you, Thank Laurent. You. One of the things I, I can add is that uh, one of the of the actions we would like to, to do more uh, to develop in the future. For the moment, uh, there is a partnership, uh, as Catherine mentioned, with the DEA, including with their uh, drug profile uh, project. In the future, it would be good for the EU to have also the capacity to cooperate and to, to develop, uh, uh, to contribute to this uh, work on, on, uh, on drug profiling. And, and as you can uh, uh, understand, uh, talking today about uh, all those changes on the cocaine market and the changes on the methamphetamine market, it's even more important than before to conduct profiling and to support profiling at EU level, because basically uh, it would tell us much more even than before about the, the production processes, the chemical processes, where those substances are coming from, and of course, in some cases, uh, what are the deterrents and the risk for health. And, and second and last point, what is, uh, what is also a significant change that I, I did not mention because we probably will further elaborate in June for the European Drug Trend Report, is the fact that polydrug use is becoming also a standard practice. So you have countries where, for instance, you have an increase in the drug-related death associated to cocaine use combined with benzodiazepines, which is also something different uh, that, uh, that uh, until recently, until some years ago, I would not pretend it did not exist, but uh, there were no cases reported to us. So this means the, 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 the addictive behaviors are in any case also becoming more complex and therefore, we need to integrate even much more the work on, the, on law enforcement, the forensic labs, the toxicology labs, and, and the potential impact and benefit of this information for strategic analysis, but also for public health interventions. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions? No more? Okay. Um, all right, so thank you very much uh, for that. So just uh, to let you know that in the room we have various experts who can be giving um, interviews after the session along with the directors. Um, we also have Jan here who is communication from Europol. So um, come to me or to Jan if you need an interview. Um, yeah, we have various experts who, who can help you with that. Um, so I think that's, that's all from us. Uh, we'll wrap up the press conference now. Um, thank you very much to all those who watched on the streaming. The streaming will now end, and in the room we can have a chat and have a coffee. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.